Well, um, good afternoon. I didn't expect to see anyone this afternoon because it's such a lovely day, but uh, welcome to all. And so this is the third session. Um, as matters have unfolded for me, it's, uh, I think it's the most interesting of the three so far. So, and, and, it, and, and I find with series like these, I really know, don't know where I'm going to end uh, because uh, the program is shaped by presentations. So um, uh, anyway, so I hope you enjoy today. Uh, it's going to be a little different. So we'll just go, we'll get that. Yeah, we'll just see. Ah, there we are. So, uh, well, this is kind of out of the run of the material to come, but I thought it was quite a good one because here's the, uh, one of Penfield's uh, diagrams. It, all of this work kind of went on in the, in the late 40s, 50s, and early 60s. And these are stimulation points on the brain which arrested speech. And if you look at it, it uh, uh, there's the Rolandic fissure, that thing kind of coming down vertically. Uh, and, the, and the temporal lobe you can see, but um, it's very interesting to compare that with, let's just go back with this PET scan study. And so um, just look at the top two, looking at words, the, the, uh, the signal is exactly where it should be. It's in the posterior part of the, of the uh, occipital lobe, you can't see the kind of the inside where most of it is, but, uh, but the localization is excellent as it is in the temporal lobe to listening to words. So that's the top right. And, um, and even with Broca's area, speaking words is exactly where it should be. Um, it's in what we would call Broca's area. But isn't it extraordinary the business about thinking of words? because now the brain lights up. And uh, if you look at it, uh, what's the, what, what are the additions? It's the association areas of the, of, the, of the frontal lobe and in the parietal lobe that are now there, uh, nothing in the visual part. Uh, so I, uh, and, and even the temporal localization isn't quite the same. So um, I thought that was an interesting match between the two. Now, this is what I inserted last evening because, uh, because I thought, well, this is kind of where today might go. Uh, some of the focus today is going to be on parts of the peripheral nervous system, or at least the spinal cord. And you think, well, that has nothing to do with the brain, except it's where we've learned a lot about the mechanisms and uh, at the cellular level, that you can't sort out with the brain. Um, so, uh, so there are several headings here. One is a theme that you may or may not know about, but, but during development, uh, the brain makes uh, at least twice as many neurons as it will ever need. And a certain competition goes on for connection. And then a winnowing process takes place. And those with, that have made successful connections are retained and the other neurons disappear without a trace. No trace of the cell is left, so-called apoptosis. So that's a, that's a really interesting phenomenon. It, it, it works also in the peripheral nervous system because uh, uh, some of the motor neurons, that, uh, or at least the motor neurons that make connections with muscles they all kind of scramble to integrate the same muscle fibers and then a certain competition takes place. And in infancy, sometimes muscle fibers are integrated by two or more motor neurons, but in the adults, only one. So there's a widowing that takes place. That's part of what happens in the nervous system. Then there's the business of resource allocation. I don't know, you probably don't know this, but you have six muscles for each eye that controls the position of your eyes. All of them have to be working perfectly in sync for you to see one image. Those are small muscles that you can see in MRI scans. And yet 
each of those muscles has maybe a thousand motor nerve cells supplying them, whereas a big chunky muscle like my deltoid or uh, one of the quadriceps muscles uh, might have uh, half that. So clearly there's an allocation that's taking place. Some er er uh, require more precise control. Now we'll talk about that a little bit more. And it's reflected in some of the later material I show with resource allocation in the neocortex because of this disproportionately large area, large areas that are devoted to the tongue, the face, especially the lips, not so much the eyes, but certainly the face and the lips and the tongue, and then the thumb, and to a lesser extent, the other fingers and the hand and the forearm, a lot more than the proximal arm and a lot more than the trunk, and about the same with the leg. So, uh, so, so the allocation is clearly being made to an area that from an evolutionary point of view was considered most important. Uh, and, uh, and that includes the dominant hand and forearm. By the way, any hand movements that take place require forearm muscles as well as the muscles in the hand. So I'm really using that term for hand and forearm. Then there's learning and memory. Well, we're gonna talk about that a little bit uh, today and more next week. There's another phenomenon that is when things go wrong in the nervous system, when diseases affect the nervous system and they affect, for example, the cell body, the first evidence of that is usually not in the cell body or anywhere near it. It's at the terminals of those nerve fibers. And so there's a link dependent degeneration that takes place. We see this every day in the clinic with say diabetic neuropathies, well, you name the neuropathy, and they're often length dependent, meaning where does it begin first symptomatically? It begins first in the toes or the foot, moves up the leg to safety by the knee, by the time it reaches the knee, and uh, maybe the distal thigh, it be beginning in the fingers or the thumb. And when it's moved up the arm and to around the, around the groin, then the sensory impairment appears on the chest and so on. So it's very length dependent. That same phenomenon occurs in the central nervous system. Nerve fibers die back from the periphery to the cell body. That's what happens. Um, then there's a the matter of functional compensation. And we see this play out all the time in, in muscle that, uh, for example, in uh, ALS or, or just with aging, if we lose motor nerve cells, um, well, it's kind of a team effort. The other motor nerve cells will often adopt the muscle fibers that have lost their motor neural. And the result is that weakness might not be apparent until maybe 50 or more percent of the neurons have actually been lost. And we know that happens in the central nervous system, for example, in Parkinson's disease, where you might have to lose anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the nerve cells and the substantia nigra and some of the other related basal ganglia before the first symptom. So this has important uh, practical playoffs, doesn't it, with respect to treatment. Um, you're already behind the eight ball at the time of the first symptom. And we actually talked about that last week uh, with the autosomal dominant transmitted Alzheimer's disease, where the biochemical changes were all, and the PET scan changes were already present two and three decades before the first symptom. So there are general principles that, that uh, we're going to be talking about uh, today. So to move on, while here it's very simple, um, most systems in the brain are functionally organized and, uh, and it's certainly true of the motor nerve cells and the spinal cord and the brain stem. And so here's this little homunculus, if you like, or the arm and just showing that, now that, that's a cross section of the spinal cord. So the back is at the top and the front part at the bottom. And uh, so they have a little arm kind of drawn there. The point is that the, all the nerve cells that are going to the hand or the, and the forearm are, are, are lateral to those that go to the trunk and proximal arm. So 
little bit of localization there. Now here, there's a lot of meat in this. Two really classy people. One, uh, that, that picture of the neuron on the, the drawing on, on uh, my left here. That's uh, Jack uh, Eccles, person I had something to do with, uh, at least over my career, uh, Nobel Prize winner. But, uh, but he was, uh, and, and uh, Sherrington, his, who was his mentor at Oxford, um, one of the central characters was the motor unit. What's the motor unit? The motor unit is the motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that motor neuron supplies. So there's a simple uh, kind of sketch on your left with the cell body at the top with the dendrites. By the way, those dendrites are the information receiving sites in nerve cells. And then this myelinated has a insulating sheath around it. And in, at least in the drawing, it showed uh, contacts with the five muscle fibers. But if you look over on the right, this is one motor unit here. And uh, maybe you can't see it here, but the, at the very top here, and here's the spinal cord, and that little thing right in there where my pointer is, that's the motor neuron. That's one motor neuron. Now, where is the motor unit? All of those little white dots are all muscle fibers supplied by one motor nerve cell. So taken together, that's a motor unit. Isn't that quite extraordinary that some one single cell like that could supply, I think I counted these earlier, I think they're around 200 muscle fibers uh, in, supplied by this particular motor neuron. Um, so, uh, and those muscle fibers, be, or the muscle fibers innervated by different uh, cells are kind of mingled or mingled together. They're overlapping territories, which kind of smooths out contraction. Now that pattern changes. If something happens to a nerve cell, uh, then you then well we'll maybe talk about it a little bit later. But that whole that that kind of pattern of single fibers or at the most two fibers in a in, in a territory will change. So let's just move on here. Now there are some, the next two slides are really something to remember for your exercise program, but uh, but also to show that complexity is everywhere in the nervous system. And it's certainly here in the genetics and the physiology and the chemistry of motor neurons and the muscle fibers they supply. So what's shown here is on the left here, there are roughly three types of motor units. They're the ones, for example, with a little, little effort, we recruit uh, small motor units, they supply relatively few muscle fibers. Those muscle fibers are fatigue resistant, so they could literally go on all day, uh, but they generate relatively little force, but there are a lot of them. So if you think about that, that's a kind of walking, a leisurely walk. Those are, those are about the only motor units you're actually recruiting in a, in a kind of a leisurely walk. Then there are these intermediate group of uh, motor units that are a little higher threshold. You have to work a little harder. You have to climb a hill, pick up the pace. And these units generate more force. And they're still relatively fatigue resistant, not entirely, but they are fatigue resistant. And then there's a relatively small number of motor units that generate large forces and they are certainly fatigable. And why? Because they depend on glucose glycogen and for their energy, which rapidly goes. And just if you look on the right here, you see, see what happens with repetitive stimulation because they're fast fatigable right at the top. Wow, just within about 20 stimuli, that thing's almost down to kind of 5% of what it was at, at the start. Uh, that's not going to help you with a long walk. And these fatigue resistant ones, uh, well, uh, that's only in relative terms. But the slow twitch, the small units, the fatigue resistant ones can kind of go at it all day long, not quite, but almost. So if I couple that with this 
this the takeaway thing. Because look at this on the bottom is the percent of the motor neuron pool. So 100%, you've recruited all the motor neurons. By the way, you've done that if, if, if you do a maximum voluntary contraction probably at about the 30 or 40% level of a maximum voluntary contraction, you've recruited all the units. And you say, well, where does the added force come from? Increasing the, the, uh, the firing rates. And then, and then the twitch of some, and, and actually the, the, the strength or power uh, increases. Now look at this. So really, uh, so, uh, we have standing at the very bottom and then walking, and then a run, even a run, uh, a jogger's run, I would say, this is a jogger's run. You probably, recruit, well, you will, will have recruited all of the fatigue resistant low force units. They're all going to be there and all in play. And probably most of those intermediate units, but none of the big ones. So if you're training, doing any strength training, you're really leaving the big guys on the bench, completely untrained. Uh, you haven't influenced them at all. Now they put jump and gallop here because they're referring to a cat here galloping and jumping. So those large twitch, uh, fast uh, or, or uh, fatigable motor units, uh, they're burst one. They're, think of them as uh, the 100 meter dash uh, motor units. Uh, after that, that have kind of pooped out. So um, now I've simplified this. This is a continuous spectrum of units here. So I've really simplified this and separating them out into three groups. Now, um, now I, a little bit of my own history here, because uh, because when I was in London Health Sciences and then the time in Boston, I was really got quite involved in uh, non-invasive ways of longitudinally studying single motor nerve cells in humans. And it actually is possible to find sites along peripheral nerves where you only get one unit. You can actually name them and go back day after day and you find exactly the same unit. And you can actually measure the force of those units. So there are two units really, the MU1 and MU2 on your right. And if you record their, that force at right angles to one another, then you can work out the resultant, the force and the vector of it. Anyway, the point is, with relatively simple techniques, you can longitudinally study uh, long, uh, you can longitudinally study single motor nerve cells and motor units. So, um, and as you might expect, uh, when we kind of grouped all of these together, no surprise, most of the units were the were they kind of the low force uh, units, and relatively few of the big ones. Well, uh, we've just shown you that in, in the previous two slides. Um, now, there's another thing uh, I might not want to hear this, but this is about aging, because because what Tim Doherty did, uh, who was one of my best graduate students. Um, in, in London, he actually measured the conduction velocities of these single motor nerve fibers. And there's a spectrum of them at the top in young people. And then on the bottom, the kind of the solid bar one is the spectrum or range for older people. Now those are healthy older people. So what's actually happening here? What would change the conduction velocity of all these? It's almost as if the whole spectrum of the younger ones is kind of shifted, in this case, to, to the left. Uh, what, what's behind that? What, what's going on with those nerve cells? Well, and I, I think they're probably actually shrinking. And the biophysics of the nerve fibers is such that, uh, that in the nerve fiber, that results in a slowing of transmission. Now, if it's happening in the peripheral nervous system, guaranteed it's happening in the central nervous system except you can't examine that kind of thing in the central nervous system. So, um, so that's an interesting point. Now, we actually got quite interested in training single motor units. I mean, uh, you go to the gym and you train a whole lot of motor units. You know, you're probably working at 20 or 30% or 
maybe 50% of all the motor units uh, that you're actually trading at a time. Uh, but we were trading single watt. And uh, the one on the left, if just look at the top thing, and these were actually trained for a period of uh, seven weeks, it looks like. And, and, on the, and on the top left there, forget, forget the bottom one, the force actually went up. That's kind of what I expected to see, what we expected to see, confirmation of what we thought. We thought the training effect would actually last, but look at it, as soon as the training stopped, down went the force. So the training effect didn't last. What we totally did not expect was that the training might have adverse effects on the output for the unit. And that's the one on your right. Because look at what happened after seven weeks of training, almost from the beginning, the force output of that motor unit is going down. Then we stop the training, it goes back up to where it was. That's almost pathological. It isn't pathological. We were probably changing the, some of the contractile characteristics of, of the unit and the chemistry, but still, it's an interesting thing that everything doesn't necessarily go the way you expect it to. Now we're going changing the frame a little bit because uh, this slide comes from Alan McComas, and Alan is, uh, was the, the head of uh, neurology and neuroscience at uh, McMaster for many years, and he had quite an interest in uh, motor nerve cells, especially uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. And what you're looking at here is the rate of decline or losses of motor units or motor nerve cells. And the, and the, the dash line at the top just shows you that even over the short time scale here, of what is it, two and a half years or something like that, there's a measurable Kind of decline, not a lot, but a little. It seems to begin around the age of 60, 65, and then it picks up. And uh, but look at the look at the steep decline of the units in the patient with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. I mean, it, it's stunning. Um, and these are the actual loss of, of motor units, motor neurons here the physical disability wouldn't be as much because of that functional compensation I, meant, uh, I mentioned earlier. Surviving cells, if they're relatively healthy, will for a time take up the slack. Now that probably happens in the central nervous system all the time with stroke injuries, traumatic injuries, that kind of thing where uh, neighboring nerve cells also take up the slack of neighbors, except that we can see it here. So, and here's one that was really quite extraordinary. I have several of these. This person, uh, th this is a little muscle over the top of your foot that none of us will miss if it's absent, but it's a great one for uh, experimental studies because it's uh, all by itself. It normally has about 200 uh, motor nerve cells supplying it. This is the sole survivor, one of around 200. Um, and, and as we've often found, or frequently found in, in um, Ugaric's disease, not all nerve cells seem to be affected to the same extent. And some of them, even though their neighbors are gone and the neighborhood is empty of other motor neurons, they keep cranking along. And this one kept going, I think, for about a year and a half without any functional impairment. But sometimes, and here's another little teaching point here, if you, um, when nerves, remember I mentioned uh, early, uh, maybe 15 minutes ago, I mentioned that uh, when nerve cells become sick for whatever reason, um, the first manifestations take place at the distal end, wherever it connects with other cells, or in this case, muscle fiber. Normally, nerve muscle transmission has a huge safety factor. In other words, you, it, that, that presynaptic end of the nerve fiber would have to be really quite abnormal for nerve muscle transmission to be blocked. So if you see any block at all, you know it's pretty bad. 
Well, you're looking at it right here because this is the same motor unit here. And normally, by the way, when you make a muscle contraction, those uh, motor nerve cells start from the very beginning here. They're firing around eight, 10, 12 hertz or times a second. That's their starting frequency. It might run up to 50, 60 hertz. Um, maybe even 100 at a, at a peak. But this fella is, is failing um, even at one per second or two per second or three per second. So well below the frequency at which it would be voluntarily recruited. And at 10 per second, which would be the normal onset firing frequency, it's down by about 20 or 30 percent. And the reason why those curves are dropping down is that uh, the, the, the motor nerve fiber has ended, or at least it has a whole bunch of branches and they're contacting muscle fibers, and those nerve muscle junctions are failing completely for some nerve muscle junction. Again, that happens in the central nervous system too. Now, this is a complex thing, but just hang in there a little bit because you get an idea here of actually what happens in a fictional case of, of uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. And so what I've done here is I've really plotted the life history of different groups of motor nerve cells. On the bottom, they're in the lumbosacral cord. So they would supply the leg and probably most especially uh, below the knee. And then in the cervical cord, they would supply the, the arm and probably mostly is from a functional point of view, the forearm and hand. And in the, um, and in the, uh, the brain stem, uh, it might affect uh, their breathing and their tongue and their ability to chew and talk, all that kind of stuff. So three populations of motor nerve cells. Time zero, that little zero at, at the bottom here is really when this started. I don't know whether you can see that, but I, well, I don't do me any good to point my finger at it. Uh, but anyway, there is a time zero at that bottom scale. And so time zero is the clinical onset when we would recognize the disease. So it's clearly, it, it's obvious here that the degeneration, that, that, that dashed line for all three is weakness, clinical weakness. But if you look at the number of nerve cells being lost, that's much greater. So what's happening at, at least a year, year and a half before the clinical onset of the disease, this person, this fictional person, uh, is losing motor nerve cells. And so isn't that the same story we talked about with uh, autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, where the disease is actually beginning several years, in that case, two or three decades before clinical manifestations. The same is true. I mentioned on that time last week, the same thing happens with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease and uh, probably all of the neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, they all have, a, have a, uh, a period of lasting a number of years before the earliest symptoms, before you would have any clue that, uh, of what was going on. And yet those are the time, times when you'd want to be treating it, right? Before somebody's actually lost nerve cells. So um, now I'm switching here because of another thing that I was very much involved with in, uh, in London, Ontario, but not so much in Boston, uh, was that I was lucky enough in London to have a neurosurgeon, John Gervin, who uh, was trained at, uh, at, uh, uh, in you know, this mapping of the, of the cortex uh, in epileptic patients by Penfield and others. And, um, and this just happens to be a picture of, 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 of the brain kind of laid out. By the way, in the bottom part, you might wonder why that kind of whitish smudgy look, this person has a brain tumor and you're actually looking at the tumor. And the reason for the mapping here was to see what could actually be moved, be removed safely without creating paralysis. 
or a speech test. Okay, so that's what all that mapping was all about. Now, here, remember, I mentioned this disproportion, this allocation of resources. Well, it's uh, here are what four examples: it's the rat, the cat, uh, a rabbit, and uh, what is it, a monkey? And if you look at it, they show the same unequal distribution of of motor nerve supply or sensory re reception. Meaning, guess what? No surprise. The front part of the head, the face, cheeks, and uh, and the tongue are big, and the distal part of the limb, and the trunk relatively small. No surprise there. And of course, this is from Penfield stuff. Isn't it quite extraordinary when you see it? On on the on the left side, is the sensory homunculus. But just look at that map on the, on, on, the, um, on the right side. I mean, the hand and the, and the face take up what looks to be almost two thirds or more of the area of the neocortex. An extraordinary disproportionate representation. And you can translate that, translate that into many more nerve cells going to the face, going to the eyes, going to the tongue, going to the thumb or the muscles that move the thumb and the fingers, and relatively much fewer to the trunk. And look at the paltry lower limb. Now, remember our story of the, the human voyage? And we get back, back, to, back to Lucy. Lucy had a has has had an opposable thumb or opposable big toe, just like we have an opposable thumb. With evolution, there's been a switch, hasn't there? Uh, from from the Lucys, the Australopithecus, of kind of four and a half billion to uh, to what, uh, one point five million years ago. Uh, when various variant species were around, but they were kind of uh, uh, small brain bipedal apes. That's, that's what they were. That was the template. And, and we don't have brains to sort out or stimulate. But my guess is the disproportionate representation might have been more to the foot and that big toe because that's how they clambered up trees, up and down trees. Then as they became fluently bipedal and upright all of the time or, or all of the time or most of the time, then, you, and you can see this in Afarensis, the so-called so Lucy, the, the big toes now come in towards the other toes. It's no longer opposable or nearly as much opposable. And, and I think probably the opposable thumb made its appearance with the genus Homo somewhere along the line. So, uh, so I'm pulling two several weeks together here uh, in that one. But, uh, and here's that uh, area four. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, area four is the, is the part of the motor cortex that is directly, it directly controls motor neurons in the brain stem, the cervical cord, to a lesser extent, the thoracic cord, and some parts of the lumbosacral cord. And uh, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit more because it's important. The area behind it, we're gonna deal with next week because that's where all the primary somatosensory information comes. That's where its destination is. Now, this is a, a really simplified section of the motor cortex and that uh, pyramidal shaped thing in the middle there. Um, that's uh, in area four, they were given the name vet cell. There aren't many of them, maybe uh, 20 or 30,000 of them. It sounds like a lot, but it isn't. But guess where they go? They go to the muscles that control the thumb and the index and middle finger. So the brain from an evolutionary point of view, is taking much more direct control over the thumb and those fingers 
the so-called precision grip that marks us. What are, what are the markers for the genus Homo, or at least later derivatives of the genus Homo? So area four has a lot of these directly connected nerve cells, and um, uh, meaning that they synapse directly with the motor neuron down on the cervical cord. Chimpanzees have a few of these, um, but no other primate, to my knowledge, has any of these direct connections. So, um, and if you, uh, this is some experimental studies, but uh, in a rhesus monkey, but they're just showing that if you stimulate the cortex, that kind of wow symbol, uh, and uh, you can activate these, uh, these, these uh, large motor neurons, in this case, not directly connected to the, to the motor neuron, but at least for the macaque. As, as, uh, as direct as it uh, can be. Now, um, so I just switched to this because uh, remember I showed you that tumor a few minutes ago. And uh, so sometimes uh, John Gerben and I work together to kind of map the cortical areas uh, for the reasons I mentioned earlier. And, but it also gave me an opportunity to, to study what actually happens when, when it when you map the, the motor cortex. And on your left, uh, the top one is the lowest threshold response. And it actually takes around 20 milliseconds, which is a long time. You wouldn't know that, but it is. And, uh, and to get the first response. And then as you turn up the juice a little bit, uh, the latency kind of shortens. And the reason it's shortening is because the stimulus is beginning to activate those direct connections. I just talked about the vet cell. On the right side, the time scale is actually quite different. It's much uh, slower. But look at the slowing of transmission through this tumor. There are still intact nerve fibers going, were intact nerve fibers going to this person's hand and forearm. And, um, and that gave pause for John about whether and to what extent he felt comfortable about resecting this tumor, how much. And uh, so I kind of stuck around through the operation just and we figured that out. But, uh, but it, it's, re it's remarkable how much transmission slowing takes place in the central nervous system in pathological situations, which is another teaching point that transmission particularly in multiple sclerosis, things like multiple sclerosis, but in this case, a tumor can be slowed. And sometimes a message arriving too late is a useless message. Sometimes messages have to arrive more or less together to be effective. So that's an illustration of that. Now, um, here's a, another kind of gimmick, uh, which is, uh, and that is, uh, believe it or not, this particular tool, this is an indirect tool for stimulating the, the brain. And it's an electrical coil, I'll just go over here and then I'll go back. But, it, but it's a coil in which, uh, look at it, it's had, there's a lot of current going through this, this coil. There are actually two of them linked here. And it does what you'd expect it to do. It induces a magnetic field, magnetic flux. And that field enters, goes through the ear, scalp, the bone, and into the brain painlessly, no pain. And it induces a very small current in the underlying brain and activates. First time I tried this out on myself, it was kind of stunning because I was standing there holding this paddle up here, and all of a sudden my thumb and hand jerks. I had no clue other than a little auditory click. But certainly no pain, and uh, th this was actually developed under a contract for I don't know why the Royal Air Force. Uh, so back in the UK, and uh, so there's the coil on the on on the right, and uh, so we'll see actually what that does. The nice thing about it is it provided us a way uh, uh, non-invasively and painlessly of assessing transmission in that vet cell 
uh, direct connection system that I've alluded to earlier. So here's an example of that, because on the left, just look at the top one here. Uh, and I think we were recording from some hand muscle group, it doesn't matter, but, but we've stimulated at the spinal root, right close to the, to the spinal cord and then way out in the, near the hand, get a nice response. And with this magnetic stimulator, we get another one. And, and, and the, the, the latency is between, uh, it's only about five or six milliseconds from the cortex down to the cervical cord. So it's pretty rapidly conducting. So in keeping, the fact that these are large neurons. Now look at it on the, on the right. We get nice responses all the way up to the ventral roots. Zero response from magnetic stimulation of the brain. And this person had um, paresis, weakness of a central origin. But it's, it's really quite striking. This is, by the way, is an old tool uh, for identifying, you know, what are the what are the, the kind of the signs of of uh, of uh, when lesions affect this part of the motor system that's coming from area four and direct or very close to to direct. Well, the reflexes are increased and they develop weakness, but it's not weakness that's everywhere. I mean, if I it, the weakness is preferentially, for example, in the arm, in the triceps, the long finger extensor muscles, and the intrinsic hand muscles. Finger flexion actually may be quite strong, as might be elbow flexion. So again, this differential innervation from the brain. But one of the other sides of the really classical one that you find in newborn babies that and it persists for a few months until the brain matures a little bit. You stroke the bottom of the foot and the toe goes up, big toe goes up. Um, but in this case, pathological lesions, uh, or at least uh, at, at a normal, it should go down. And then with the, the pathological lesions goes up, just like it did with uh, infants. Now we're gonna move on a little bit because I'm trying to get to some questions here, but. Um, and I'm putting a lot of stuff together here, but one uh, technology that's been developed well in the last uh, 10 years, especially, is uh, so-called deep brain stimulation. You may have heard of this. So they actually put a, an electrode right through a hole in your, in your, like a little hole in the skull and uh, run this electrode down and to kind of a preferred site in the brain where you think it might be effective. It was, this was first tried, I think, in patients with Parkinson's disease, because sometimes, uh, I mean, Parkinson's disease is very treatable uh, for about five or 10 years. And then people start to run into troubles with their medication, they're not responsive to the medication, or they get extraneous extra movements. It becomes really quite troublesome. And one way around it, is with this deep brain stimulation. Or the other one is a benign essential tremor. Well, there's nothing benign about it if every time you go to speak or move your hand, it starts shaking. Uh, but um, but it, it, it's incredible because I remember being up in Thunder Bay and, and working with somebody from London Health Sciences who was uh, working with a surgeon doing this deep brain stimulation. And he said, well, watch this. And it's, it's a pacemaker. This is what this is. Instead of a heart pacemaker, this is actually a brain pacemaker, but with an electrode kind of stuck. To, and, and this fellow, I remember, he had this very, very striking tremor in his hand, and sometimes really quite coarse. They turn on the current, the hand just completely still. They could move it quite well in a coordinated fashion. No pain, no sensation and then turned it off. And after a little pause, back came the tremor. Now, it's turned out to be very helpful for the things that I've just mentioned, meaning Parkinson's disease and benign essential tremor. Uh, it's now being tried out uh, as a way of enhancing memory by implanting an electrode like this or one that's been implanted uh, for temporal lobe epilepsy uh, to enhance memory. 
because the inside, the medial side of the temporal lobe is the essential mechanism for laying down memories and retrieving them. If that's not working, you don't remember anything that you experienced. And uh, that famous case at the Hill uh, year, years ago, the Brendan Milner follow, uh, by mistake, they actually lesioned both temporal lobes and literally cut, cut off the system. And he was unable to form any new memory. Um, anyway, so deep brain stimulation. And it's a good example of it. There's a larger example of it. It's, um, anyway, it's, uh, I'm always amazed that something as crude as this actually works. I mean, it, it's a real, the brain is really complex. And the fact that you get away with something uh, like this, uh, uh, it always stuns me. I'm, I'm happy that we can, but, um, but I'm also uh, somewhat surprised. Now, here's one. Um, it's also um, the whole field, uh, say, in the last 10 or 15 years of uh, recording from the brain and using the signals created by the brain to control an artificial prosthesis or perhaps a partially paralyzed limb um, has really opened up or, or, uh, or giving some people a measure of control over their legs uh, when they're totally paralyzed. I have to say from what I've seen, I haven't been too impressed with its, uh, with its ability to give people uh, useful movement in their legs who are paraplegic. Can they stand? Yes. Can they take a few steps? Yes. The trouble is they don't have much in the way of sensory feedback, which we all depend on. Um, but anyway, um, uh, we're in this particular example, um, what they, and this was a one of, uh, I think four or five volunteers, this, this, Lady had uh, um, had Gehrig's disease and was paralyzed at both arms. You can see that she's on a ventilator, and um, and she's lost the ability to communicate. So they've implanted electrodes just underneath the on the uh, on the undersurface of the of the skull, so-called subdural electrodes. And, um, and then they recorded uh, the brain activity. Well, let, let me just introduce this a little bit. About the, what is 1985, Jack Eccles, the, the one I mentioned earlier, visited London, Ontario. And I remember him standing at the podium and just tapping the podium like this. And, and said, well, what do you imagine is going on? when I do this. And he said, well, and then the next slide came up. And, uh, and what, what he showed was an average electrical signal that preceded the movement by at least uh, a tenth of a second. So the movement, each tap was preceded by some electrical discharge probably the sum signals of, of maybe hundreds of neurons, maybe even thousands in, in, in the, the neurons in, in, in the motor cortex at associated regions. So what they've done here is they've kind of built on that, haven't they? They've said, okay, um, this person, um, if this person imagined moving the thumb or finger, or choosing one of those letters or numbers there, if they imagine that, there's probably a related signal, electrical signal that we can pick up with electrodes stuck on the top of the brain. Again, it, it pulls me over that a crude four electrode array could do this, but anyway, it does. Now they use artificial intelligence here because to kind of uh, winnow out 
a lot of the noise and learn. And she took six months to learn how to actually select letters or numbers on that screen that you see. But she could do it. Now, uh, I have to say, when I, uh, uh, when I looked at this, I thought, gee, why would you go to all that bother when, it, um, when uh, many patients with ALS, you know, you can track their eye movement. And if you know where they're looking at, if they can look at a screen like that and look right at a letter, uh, then that seems to be a lot simpler than this. But, uh, but anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to have done. They, they made their, their case. And, um, uh, um, and I, I'm sure the field's going to develop further, but, it, um, but it's a complex one. Now, here's a, these are uh, two subjects. And I'll bet you can't see that, if I, but I'll put my little pointer down. Well, there's an arrow there. So maybe you can see the arrow. But they put an electrode array here into the temporal lobe, kind of about here. Well, yeah, about here. And remember I said that that medial part, the hippocampus, uh, and its connections are, are really critical to uh, remembering and storing that memory and retrieving it. So uh, it's not a crazy idea. Can you boost memory by stimulating that area? Well, um, they seem to think so. Um, I, I'm not sure. I think that it's open. Now, I did oh, yeah, talk longer than I thought. I, I put this in because uh, this fits with our age, doesn't it? This is a lovely article in, uh, in, in science, but it was also in nature. And it was a study of, um, of uh, chimpanzees, our age, meaning males, uh, well, younger than us, I think. Um, probably, uh, I would guess, middle-aged uh, chimps. And, uh, and male chimps, young male chimps, are, are pesky and troublesome and irritable and, and uh, sometimes not pleasant to have around. But it turns out that when they reach what we would consider midlife and later, they become much more concerned with relationships and friendships, long-term friendships with other males and females without sex necessarily, that which is a change for chimps. Uh, and, and, uh, and it, so it's an interesting change in social behavior that seemed to be um, the rule ra rather than the exception. And I thought, well, see, um, that what happened to me? Um, but anyway, I, it, it's an interesting observation. 